Folks, thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on 5G Inside, Things to Know About 5G Indoor Network Design. I'm Kelly Hill, Executive Editor of RCR Wireless News, and I will be your, web your moderator for today's webinar, which is brought to you by Chatsworth Products. RCRWireless.com is our website. That is where you will be able to download the free editorial special report that also deals with this issue. And you can find a lot of other great industry news on a daily basis. So let's go ahead and get you introduced to your panelists today. I am very happy to uh, be the moderator today. I'm executive editor of RCR Wireless. We are also joined by Elizabeth Lundin, uh, an executive director of network engineering with Verizon. We have Manish Tripathi, who is vice president of engineering with Qualcomm Technologies, and Roger Gagubin, who is strategic product manager. Whoop, and then I need to go back. <clears throat> excuse me, strategic product uh, management in uh, the product line radio at Ericsson. And we're also joined by Joe Schmelzer, who is chief marketing officer at ED2. So a lot of great perspectives today. Uh, we are going to get into presentations and speaking time from each of them, and then we will have time for question and answer at the end. So I highly encourage all of you to submit questions through the user interface as we go along. Just a few highlights from that report that will be published uh, shortly on rcrwireless.com. A few things to know about indoor millimeter wave uh, and um, its abilities to support transformational speed low latency and all the other things that we want to see out of 5G, but propagation characteristics can be challenging. Um, outside in coverage, everybody I talk to is basically like, yeah, that's not really going to happen. Um, extremely difficult in outdoor in, in millimeter wave coverage, but once you get it inside, uh, you've got a surprisingly robust environment. Um, penetration between walls and whatnot, depending on building materials, can be um, you know fairly good. And reflections actually help quite a bit in terms of uh, getting you some some pretty good signal strength. In terms of what the equipment looks like right now, you know the main candidates for indoor coverage are DAS, small cells, and signal boosters or repeaters. Um, there are new products on the way and you also have a lot of development on the customer premise equipment side to help get that signal indoors. Uh, we're likely to see more proliferation of fiber and power needs in order to support the performance and uh, you know and the um, the number of access points needed for, for some of these systems. Um, millimeter wave indoor coverage and early deployments is mostly focused on large public venues and high density areas of cities. Um, and there are some folks who are wondering at this point if, you know, we're going to see sort of a similar, similarly strategic approach play out inside buildings as outside, you know, that there may not be millimeter wave pervasive across an entire building. It may be reserved to some of the areas where, you know, a specific application is being supported, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, you know, 5G and other bands will be used to, to cover other areas of the building. So it will be interesting to see how all of those things play out. And now I am going to hand it over to Elizabeth from Verizon and uh, she is going to give some ins insights from there. Elizabeth? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, thanks for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk to everybody. Um, as Kelly said, I am uh, Elizabeth Lundin. I am an executive director of network engineering at Verizon. And specifically within the network engineering organization, I lead a team that's responsible for all indoor, like in-building and venue deployments, right? So uh, my team is responsible for the design, the strategy, the execution, the planning um, for really any indoor connectivity project that we have going forward. So you know, I'm really excited to talk to everybody today about indoor 5G. It's a passion of mine. Um, I'm going to share with you how we're making sure it's built right here at Verizon and also how we at Verizon are working across the entire ecosystem to innovate and deliver for our customers. Uh, we're very bullish on the potential of indoor 5G. We're really all in on it. And honestly, it's part of the reason why we've created a team like mine, because our sole focus is on bringing wireless connectivity indoors, and that's going to be more critical than ever in a 5G world. You know, Kelly mentioned it in her, uh, her lead-in, you know, the outside to in penetration of millimeter wave might not be the best, but once you get it indoors, you can do a lot with it. Um, and the biggest thing for us at Verizon is really that 5G, particularly millimeter wave 5G or 5G ultra wideband, is not an incremental step up from 4G. It's not just an icon on the phone, it's really, it's a transformational leap 
that's going to enable groundbreaking new use cases and technologies, you know, some of which, honestly, we probably can't quite imagine just yet. You know, I think back to 10 years ago, you know, if you told me I was going to use my mobile phone to get into a stranger's car, I would have told you you're absolutely nuts, right? Um, but today, that's just second nature to us, and there are dozens and hundreds of other applications that have similar kind of wow factor. And that's the same type of transformation that we're looking to drive with 5G innovation at Verizon. You know, and to do that, we've invested very heavily over the past few years in the technologies that are needed to deliver 5G, particularly indoors, because the indoor space is where the innovation happens. Um, the decisions we've made in our core architecture, you know, the virtualization of multiple network elements, the edge platforms we've built as part of our intelligent edge network, combined with our investments in fiber and millimeter wave spectrum, really allow us to bring 5G to a customer's premise quickly and efficiently. Um, we've been putting 5G in indoor environments since day one. Um, and by day one, it you know, sounds like a long time, really about a year and a half ago, right? But we've, we've been all in indoors since then. Um, so far, all of those deployments have been completed using you know, a powered down outdoor GNOD. And they performed exceedingly well for us. And they've allowed us to light up you know, 43 stadiums, seven airports, dozens of our retail locations, and a handful of 5G labs and innovation centers. Uh, but they have their limitations. So that's why the work that we're doing right now with Corning and Samsung to bring a millimeter wave indoor DAS to market by the end of this year is really what's going to push our indoor 5G capabilities into overdrive in 2020 and beyond. The indoor DAS is going to allow us to bring 5G to indoor environments that aren't suitable for GNOD-B, and also on a much more efficient cost structure. And the distributed nature it's going to allow for fast and simple future scale of indoor millimeter wave coverage. Now, as Kelly mentioned, um, similar to an outdoor deployment, uh, you, know, you want to make sure that you put millimeter wave in the right place in a building, right? And so today, that right place might be one part of a building. Tomorrow, it might be a different part of the building. So by having a distributed antenna system, you can really, you know, you invest in the, the head end space, essentially, and then you can put the antennas wherever you want, you know, for, for years to come. Um, and also by using these solutions, we're going to be able to expand our product offerings to bring more optionality for our customers. I, I hinted at it earlier, I really can't emphasize the next point enough, which is that 5G indoor design is all about putting the right technology in the right place for the customer. You know, we're super excited about the opportunities that that brings with the distributed antenna system, and especially with private 5G in particular. By combining a dedicated core, our indoor distributed antenna products, and our MET capabilities, we're going to be able to provide enterprises with a robust private network that will enable innovation in a highly secure, low latency environment with multi gigabit throughput capabilities. Because 5G indoor design is again all about putting the right technology in the right place, our architecture will allow for the customer to choose some or all of our end to end capabilities. Some customers may just want a millimeter RAN with a public core. Some may just want MEC, or some may want a hybrid millimeter wave low band LTE approach. The way we're thinking about indoor 5G design allows the customer to be in control of how we design, build, and deliver a solution for them. Now, I think a great example of this are the recent partnerships we've announced. You know, we've announced partnerships with groups like the NHL, General Motors, Honeywell, the New York Times, amongst others. And the awesome thing about this is that each of these groups, each of our partners has their own unique needs and focus areas. And we're working with all of them individually to deliver the 5G solutions that work best for their business. I spent a lot of time in my job meeting with customers and talking to them about you know, the future of indoor 5G and what it can mean for their business. And the number one question that inevitably, inevitably comes up is, what can I do now to make sure my campus is ready for 5G? And the honest response I give is always, well, what do you want to do with 5G? And it's, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek response. It's, it's also the important first step in working with the customer to reach that right technology in the right place and design. But not every customer knows exactly what they want to do with 5G right off the bat, and that's okay. You know, there are a few critical elements that go into every single indoor 5G design, and I make sure to share those with every customer as well. The most important thing to remember in any 5G network deployment is that fiber is king. Without the massive capacity that fiber backhaul enables, you're unable to deliver a truly transformative 5G experience. 
For an indoor 5G network, this also means ensuring that you have adequate fiber runs throughout your building to feed the distributed antennas from the head end room. The 5G millimeter wave distributed antennas, unlike past generations that are fed by either coax or, or cat six, are fed by fiber. So you need to have really dense fiber throughout your entire building. And the head end room is another really important element in indoor 5G network design. While we're obviously leading innovation with 5G at the forefront, the reality is, is we're gonna be living in a hybrid 4G, 5G world for at least a few years until 5G device penetration reaches maturity. This means we need extra rack space and additional power and cooling elements in the head end room to accommodate uh, dual equipment. Forward thinking building owners are working today to make sure that their head end rooms are prepared with adequate power and space and cooling to accommodate those expansions. We at Verizon just really couldn't be more excited about the opportunity 5G presents to transform society. And we've been working hard over the past few years to prepare our network and our business to lead that transformation in the indoor space. So I just want to thank you guys again for letting us share our perspective today. And I look forward to answering your questions. All right. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Really appreciate that perspective and sort of setting the scene. <clears throat> and hearing some more about what Verizon is doing. And, and I will note, you mentioned uh, Honeywell and General Motors. Those, that, that, that news actually just came out. That is brand yes. new news. Out of the press. Press. <laughs> yes, as of, as of about you know, less than two hours ago, I think that, uh, that they are providing indoor coverage for Honeywell and General Motors. So uh, that's, you heard it here for first, folks. All right, so let's go on and uh, we're going to hand things over to Manish Tripathi from Qualcomm. Great, thank you, Kelly, and hi, everyone. Uh, great to be talking to you over this uh, uh, topic of providing 5G coverage indoors. And um, it's a very important topic for us as Qualcomm. And, and certainly, Elizabeth, we appreciate uh, how Verizon has embraced uh, the 5G technology and you guys are really driving it out there and realizing it um, in commercial deployments. Uh, so in the brief presentation uh, I have here today, I'm going to uh, walk you through some of the uh, practical deployments that are already happening with millimeter wave indoors uh, to give you a flavor of what it looks like and, and what kind of performance we can get out of it uh, and, and what are the other possibilities here as well. Uh, so with that, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, if you look at uh, how traditionally networks have been deployed in the past, like when we went from 3G and then from 3G to 4G, uh, so the focus traditionally always is around outdoor deployments, right? Uh, the operators try to uh, provide the uh, wireless coverage in the, in the larger macro network outdoors, uh, and of course that provides some coverage indoors as well. Uh, and we see millimeter wave uh, certainly playing a key role there. And as we have already seen in the US with the commercial deployment of millimeter wave that has happened, uh, we already have um, several cities, uh, I think more than 55 cities now uh, who already have commercial uh, millimeter wave deployments in city centers, downtown areas and such. Uh, but while that is happening uh, with 5G, uh, we also see a very significant interest and, and things already happening on the ground, as Elizabeth was also pointing out, in indoor deployments as well. And this is where basically uh, 5G millimeter wave can uh, coexist side by side with the existing Wi-Fi deployments, maybe even leverage some of the infrastructure that already exists for that Wi-Fi deployment, uh, but uh, bring a more superior, more reliable, a more secure network uh, to enable a whole set of new use cases uh, to be enabled on that deployment. Uh, and of course, then it opens up new possibilities for these uh, venue owners to like connect with the people who are using their venue and, and maybe even create new business opportunities for them. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, if we look at uh, where things are going right now and where we are at the early stages, so I think uh, here's some examples of how millimeter wave is already uh, progressing, especially in, in indoor environments. Uh, so, uh, so one evolving case where, and I'll show you some examples of it as to how it will work, is that a 5G millimeter wave being deployed in office environments. Uh, and, um, and it can very well uh, work side by side with Wi-Fi, and I'll actually illustrate that in the next few slides as to how that is feasible. Uh, then in the uh, venues, uh, 
we already have uh, several NFL stadiums and other smaller uh, MLB stadiums or arenas or convention centers already deployed with commercial uh, millimeter wave networks. And this is where it really makes a big difference. And again, I'll show you some examples of what that really looks like. Uh, because this is where a lot of people come together and there's obviously a lot of usage of the network and with the traditional 4G networks, uh, given the spectrum constraints we have, given the performance constraints we have, um, uh, we are not really able to meet all the demands that users throw at it. But with millimeter wave, the game changes completely. Uh, the same thing applies to transportation hubs like airports, uh, train terminals, where again, millions of passengers go through uh, some of these larger venues and again a lot of traffic that is uh, generated uh, and and then at the home also while suddenly as uh, i think kelly had it on her uh, one of her slides that millimeter wave may not necessarily uh, propagate so well indoors uh, but with the use of um, uh, equipment like cpe customer premise equipment uh, we are able to get millimeter wave coverage inside the homes and this is actually uh, while this is already being done in the suburban areas today, uh, commercially, uh, but we also see this really ch uh, changing the experience significantly in the rural or the underserved areas where typically it's very hard to get a good broadband connection because of the um, low availability of fiber and, and DSL or cable modem kind of services. And lastly, on the industrial IoT side as well, again, there's some very interesting uh, use cases and scenarios that are coming up where millimeter wave and 5G really uh, start playing a big role there. And I'll show you some examples of all of these. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, when earlier, uh, when 5G uh, millimeter wave started getting deployed, uh, there were a lot of concerns people had, or there were a lot of uh, myths that existed that 5G millimeter wave will not, given that it doesn't penetrate very well, that it will not really work and it will be too limited coverage and indoors it will not work. So here we have an example of a live 5G millimeter wave network on our campus in San Diego. So you can see that in the picture here at the bottom uh, where you can see the two antennas uh, which are installed in our lobby. And with that, if you could click to the next one, please, in this. Well, there's an animation here, yeah, thank you. So, um, so here you can see that uh, those dots in this picture are basically showing actual measurements one of our engineers did, walking around and seeing the signal strength that uh, for the millimeter wave network. And you can see that uh, there were places we went like in the corridors uh, where we were completely in non-line of sight. We even went behind the site. Uh, the top part of the building that you see there, uh, there's actually an elevator shaft there with metal, concrete, all that stuff. And still we are able to get millimeter wave coverage in that area. And, and by millimeter wave coverage, I mean like hundreds of megabits of uh, throughput still being achieved in those fringe areas. So, and this just works because millimeter wave, while it may not penetrate well, my, while it may not diffract very well, it does reflect very well. And given the diverse materials that we have in indoor environments, it actually um, propagates very well, as we can see from this picture. And that's why uh, we see this working very well in enterprise environments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so then the next question that comes up in indoor deployment, especially when we talk of enterprises, is uh, how, how would the deployment be? Would it be as complicated as it is for 4G networks today? And if you could click through this as well, please, the animation. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so what we did in this case is this is the floor plan, again, of the same building I was showing on the previous slide. And here, what we did is we, with our IT department, we identified the locations where all the Wi-Fi APs are on that floor. And then if you click again, please, uh, we simulated what, if we put 5G millimeter wave sites on top, what that coverage will look like. And as you can see from this picture, uh, by doing that one-to-one -one deployment, we are able to cover the entire floor uh, but more importantly, of course, uh, given the huge bandwidth that comes with millimeter wave and the performance that comes with it, we are able to deliver a pretty significant user experience. So one key takeaway on this is that um, you can see this, that the deployment becomes a lot easier because 
all we are saying is if you have Wi-Fi in an enterprise environment, which typically is the case, you could pretty much do a one-to-one -one deployment of a 5G millimeter wave network. And the products that are coming out now, the small cells that are coming out now with millimeter wave, are, are uh, in form factor very similar to a typical enterprise Wi-Fi AP, and they even work over PoE. So you could just leverage your existing ethernet infrastructure that already exists in your building and, um, and run your 5G millimeter wave network side by side and get a much more reliable and secure network. So that's really exciting part of it. Next slide, please. Uh, in the venues, so again, um, this is one of the NFL stadiums, uh, one of the big events in the um, NFL venues where we uh, collaborated with one of the operators. Uh, and here again, you can see that um, in this case, the 5G deployment, the number of sites that were deployed in the venue were 15 times less than what the 4G deployment was. Uh, yet the, uh, the expanded capacity you get, the performance you get with 5G allowed us to experience up to 10x improvement in the user experience while the users were sitting side by side and running tests side by side on the 4G and the 5G network. So this is where um, 5G really, and especially millimeter wave becomes a game changer because now you can realize a lot of the fan experiences that we only thought of like providing multi-camera viewing angles as you're watching a sports event and all of those kind of things. Next slide, please. Uh, same thing, we, uh, we actually did a trial uh, in France at a train station, um, kind of a similar thing where you have a lot of users going through the venue. And again, they're uh, easy, very easy, just with two uh, sites, as you can see in this picture, it was very easy to realize um, multiple gigabits of um, throughputs here. Next slide, please. And then on the broadband side, although this is not really indoor-indoor um, indoor per se, but, but we actually did a trial uh, in rural Wisconsin with US Cellular and Ericsson earlier this year. And in this case, we again um, busted the myth around the propagation of 5G millimeter wave. And as you can see in, in conditions where we had line of sight to the antenna, and remember in rural areas, the sites are typically much taller than your typical urban sites to cover more geographic areas. So with this and using a high power CPE, which are again products that are already coming out, uh, we were able to demonstrate that even over distances of five kilometers, uh, you could still get more than 200 megabits per second of user experience. So this becomes a very compelling uh, deployment scenario in rural areas where traditionally it's been very challenging to provide broadband services. And, and we will uh, start seeing adoption of this more and more um, in, in to enable this. Next slide, please. And then lastly, uh, from an industrial environment perspective as well, we have actually recently uh, been working with a manufacturing partner in uh, Asia uh, who had a factory uh, where they were, they had several interesting use cases. They had like AGVs running on the floor with 360 cameras on them and uh, with the aim of capturing um, the environment around them as, as stuff was being manufactured on the factory floor and be able to monitor where there's any bottlenecks in terms of equipment, in terms of personnel, or, or if any machines get stalled and those kind of things. So, so we've designed this uh, 5G millimeter wave network uh, to help them be able to pull out this live camera feed, which they were not able to do earlier, off of these AGVs. And similarly also enable them to uh, have uh, deployments like um, using augmented reality where a technician could go out to one of these machines and be assisted by a more expert sitting back in their office somewhere and help them figure out a problem by just um, being able to see what they're seeing and then being able to project uh, what they need to do as a next step. So some very exciting uh, possibilities here with 5G. So with that, I will end my presentation and I look forward to taking your questions and getting into further Q&A and discussion and the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Manish. Uh, great examples there of, uh, of real world examples. So uh, Roger, we're going to hand it over to you to, uh, to talk about bringing 5G indoors. Thanks so much.
uh, happy to be here with everybody uh, and uh, really following on what we heard from uh, Elizabeth and Manish here. I think we, you'll see some, some common themes in what uh, we will show from the Ericsson side. So maybe on the, the next slide, I'll, I'll start just by giving a, a very brief global perspective what's been happening in the last 18 months from a 5G uh, point of view. So globally, over 100 networks now live, 65 of them powered by Ericsson. We have uh, live networks in uh, 33 countries, over 80 operators already with uh, the spectrum sharing technology on, on, on FTD bands, as uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and how, how you can uh, take advantage of your existing infrastructure uh, in, in uh, low, lower bands in FTD and provide some level of 5G experience there as well. Uh, and over 100,000 uh, ESS cells live and of course growing very fast. One data point I, I would like to point out here, if you look at South Korea, uh, where we have seen the 5G uh, uh, subscriber penetration grow at a, at a very fast pace, uh, you can see a significant uh, increase in data traffic demand per subscriber, 27 gigabytes uh, uh, per month. So yeah, 5G is real, it's here, and uh, it will continue to, to uh, grow at a very uh, uh, fast pace. Uh, so in the next slide, I wanted to just uh, quickly look at a, a research that we've done looking at different 5G use cases and what customers would be uh, willing to uh, pay extra to, to, to have that experience. Of course, we're, we're, I'm not going to go through every circle. Don't worry, that will take a long time. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight in the context of our conversation today in inbuilding is that you will see that many of these 5G use cases that will bring additional uh, uh, revenues to operators and uh, uh, enter entertainment uh, uh, locations or building owners that are offering those services uh, are focused on the in-building uh, space. You can look at the entertainment industry, you can look at gaming, AR, VR, uh, you can look, of course, uh, uh, mobile broadband. It's, it's uh, very common, just an extension of what has been happening since the 3G days and then 4G and now 5G. That's the most obvious one. But uh, smart homes, uh, including using uh, millimeter wave signal inside the homes, as Manish was just uh, describing, uh, and very happy that you, you pointed out that example, Manish, of the the over five kilometers that we achieved together with the Qualcomm team uh, recently. Uh, so yeah, the technology is certainly advancing and enabling all of these use cases now to, to be a reality. And uh, I just would like to uh, reiterate what uh, Elizabeth mentioned earlier, that these are just use cases that we are sort of aware of right now, but there is still a lot more that will happen over the coming years uh, that this technology will enable. So th this list will continue to be enhanced and, and to grow over time. Uh, so next slide, I would like to talk a little bit about indoor small cells because uh, uh, we see that as one of the key enablers to bring a, a 5G experience that is uh, differentiated from what we had in the uh, 3G and 4G days. Uh, as uh, uh, Manish mentioned, you know, we used to have a particular infrastructure, right? And, and a particular way of delivering solutions uh, to, to buildings and, and a lot of it. And uh, one could argue that still the vast majority of buildings in the US today are being served by outside in signal in low band. And uh, we still have some frustration uh, uh, from, from users going in buildings and not having sufficient experience as what they might experience uh, uh, out, outdoors. Uh, so how do, we, how do we solve, how we as an industry can make this easier? Uh, and that has been uh, uh, the challenge that we've been working on together uh, uh, with, the, uh, with our partners, uh, Qualcomm and the operators as well, such as Verizon and, and Pierce, and, and, and making 
the total cost of ownership lower, making it easier to, to be deployed. Uh, examples that were pointed out before, such as uh, uh, power over ethernet, reusing uh, the, the electrical cabling infrastructure that we have in many buildings is certainly a, 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 a sort of low hanging fruit, but beyond that, uh, keeping it uh, uh, very uh, easy for from a services point of view, even if the equipment helps to solve some of that problem by being easier to deploy, there's still a services component and, uh, and coming into a building and doing construction. Uh, we, we have one airport that we've been working on for a, a number of months uh, uh, out west, a major international airport with our radio dot system is being uh, deployed now. Uh, and as you can imagine, disruption uh, at a facility such as an airport is significant, right? So you want to make sure that when, once you go in, you go and get it done and, and it's a solution that can evolve, can grow over time, uh, whether it's some additional equipment in the head end or ideally, as we have done in many cases, you can add additional capacity such as adding more cells via software configuration without having to even go and visit the site. Traditionally, we have done a lot of uh, adding bands and, and adding channels by going and visiting uh, the, the head end room. But there are things we can do now via software that uh, would even uh, avoid a visit to site altogether. So uh, uh, we see indoor uh, uh, 5G, uh, uh, indoor small cells as a key enabler. So next slide, please. Um, I won't spend much time here. We, we talked a lot about this today. Uh, as you see the, the spectrum, uh, uh, the capability of the different areas of the spectrum, whether you're in low band or, or millimeter wave, as you see here in purple, of course, you have a, a, a revolutionary uh, uh, capacity and experience with millimeter wave. And we've talked about that a lot, but we should not ignore the mid band spectrum either because there is significant uh, benefit in that mid spectrum, uh, mid band spectrum layer in providing phenomenal Phenomenal capacity in certain use cases in building. Of course, propagation is better than millimeter wave. Even with all the advances we've made in millimeter wave, and we can talk about examples and sites where we have deployed, uh, you will still get a, a lower cost of ownership with mid-band, but maybe you have to compromise on the capacity and experience to a certain extent. Maybe with mid-band you get to that gigabit per second performance you're looking for, which might be fine for uh, most most uh, multi-tenant uh, buildings and, and the enterprise locations, typical office locations, but not sufficient for your uh, high-end sports venue where you certainly want to bring in the high band, right? So next slide. Um, and just, a, just a, a, a quick comparison here to where we were with the traditional active DAS deployments where you have all this uh, amount of infrastructure that, that needs to be installed, uh, oftentimes balanced, uh, optimized, um, and certainly limited in the, the number of, of MIMO streams that you're able to support. Uh, in the past, we would come back, come, in, come to the head end room and add radio units and baseband's or whatever. But but that is uh, uh, certainly an infrastructure that does not scale very well. Uh, and now with the distributed radio systems uh, uh, that exist in, in the market, such as the, the radio dot system, you have a much simpler solution where you have one uh, intelligent active antenna point that you manage that supports multiple bands. Uh, and then of course you can support multiple carriers in that same location. So you deploy one intelligent antenna point, you have multiple MIMO branches, multiple bands, uh, and and using a single uh, electrical cable, right? A CAT6 uh, uh, type of infrastructure, the same one uh, the, uh, your IT and Wi-Fi deployments are using. Uh, one of the things that is important to highlight, uh, I think uh, Elizabeth touched on that point, is uh, deep fiber requirements. So how far can we take uh, electrical cabling into the future? And that it, it, 
even though we, we want to reuse this technology for as long as we can, uh, uh, laws of physics apply. So there, there will come a day where, you, where that uh, 10 gigabit per second pipe that you're able to drive from an electrical cable will not be sufficient. And uh, 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 then a transition to fiber will be required. But we still believe that for most mid-band and low-band requirements, uh, there is still plenty of life with electrical cabling and even some millimeter wave, if, if you're doing up to 400 uh, megahertz of deployment, you, you can do that. But uh, uh, going beyond that with 800 megahertz and millimeter wave and then multi-band adding a wider uh, a TDD spectrum uh, in mid-band, uh, you, you will certainly need to consider fiber deployment. Next slide. And uh, one other aspect I would like to bring up is, is the, the virtualization in 5G. And, and, and we see that if, even though we, we're very focused on our conversation today about RF propagation, designing and building, uh, let's not forget that an important component of the solution is where your RAN processing is happening, right? So traditionally, and we, we still have purpose-built basebands that are fantastic and they can do two, three, four, 5G on a single one U box, right? Super powerful. Uh, but uh, going forward, adding the flexibility of virtualization is, is also uh, super important. And uh, we, we see that as a, as a great, great value in the overall 5G ecosystem as now you have resources centralized used both for your macro and indoor deployments. And uh, I think that was my uh, last slide, maybe just a quick summary point here. So 5G is here, it's headed indoors by all means. Uh, be mindful of the, what spectral, uh, spectrum assets you have, which ones make sense in, in different venues. Each venue is different, and so, but we have solutions that will meet the needs of, of that venue for sure. Uh, and multi-operator solutions will continue to be a strong drive, especially with enterprises want to finance their systems and venue owners so they will want a system that uh, allows all of their customers and visitors to have a, a wonderful experience. So I'll look forward to taking your questions later on. Thank you, Kelly. Great. Thank you, Roger. All right. Wonderful. Uh, Joe, we're going to have time for you, and then we will dive into questions. So all right. go ahead. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Joe Schmelzer from ED2 Corporation. We're an emerging a 5G product company based out of uh, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we have deep experience in 5G, uh, microwave, millimeter wave, um, and, the, and related technologies. Today, we are bringing a, a millimeter wave a repeater system to market. We have a couple different configurations, which I can, um, you know, I can engage with you uh, offline about. Uh, next slide, please. I'll try to I'll try to go through this relatively quickly so we have time for for discussion. So one thing about 5G that um, I wanted to just sort of uh, mention is, and, and again, this is part of what where where my experience um, in the industry over the last several years um, provides a certain advantage point that 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 um, I think is useful um, in that in, in that the customers and people who are using um, these wireless services and these capabilities, uh, a, a lot of people, if we're talking about indoor, we're talking about building owners, we're talking about property owners, property managers, um, people that have maybe a certain level of technical capability, but they're not focused in 5G like everybody on this call is. And so they don't quite understand some of the nuances, they just see the term 5G and, and, and try to go forward there. But I think it's important for us in the industry, especially as we get closer to actual customers, to, to really sort of be specific about what we're talking about. And there's a number of different KPIs that, that are involved in 5G. Um, and I think it's kind of important to understand the ones that, that customers care about and also the, the kinds of 5G that's being delivered because they're not all the same. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been saying this for a while, 5G is not one thing. There's actually 
a bunch of different things that that all incorporate 5G. And it's it, this is I've been I've been in the in this industry since um, you know since the first G I guess. And it's interesting if you look at the progression here with each generation of technology from 1G to 5G uh, or 1G to 4G, there was always sort of a clear, crystal clear marker that 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 the service offered. Um, with 1G, you got voice. With 2G, you got text. With 3G, you got uh, email capability. With 4G, you have video. And you know all the various flavors of those th- those things kind of all met that minimum. Um, that minimum baseline of of the expectation of the customer. Um, 5G has been a little bit of a challenge where not only is the customer expectations, they're sort of all over the place, but what is actually being delivered is all over the place. So I think it's, as we approach this indoor space, um, even today on the call uh, on this this webinar, I've, I've heard different statements made that that may apply, apply in some contexts and won't apply in other contexts. So I think it's 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 important for us in the industry to to be specific about about this stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So I like uh, I like I think T-Mobile had a had a nice visual here. I think this is interesting that um, this I like I like this visual because it really represents reality. And the reality on the ground is that our customers, whether they're buildings or they're uh, you know, like a, a multiple d- uh, dwelling units or, you know, con- uh, commercial places like stadiums or, or, or airports or shopping centers, they're using a variety of technologies. And so we sort of have to understand that as we, as we go forward and address their, their needs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, f- again, on my 5G is not one thing theme, you can look at, this is just some of the recent messaging and positioning from from the leadership uh, the leaders in in uh, in 5g um, Verizon's talking about ultra wideband and, and 5g nationwide AT&T started with 5g e and now they're now they've they're they're messaging around 5g plus and then um, t-mobile is just sort of saying coverage or no coverage with their five with their 5g which is kind of interesting so um, just just looking at some of the market um, differences here uh, next slide please so one one comment I wanted to make when we when we look at when we look at delivering five G service uh, in a building, um, and, and when we market these use cases and market the capabilities, we really have to pay close attention to what we're selling. Um, if you look at some of the some of the um, the services and the and the metrics that are being delivered into the marketplace. If you read the fine print, these things are being delivered over 800 megahertz of spectrum, or maybe 400 megahertz of spectrum. And some of the indoor systems that we're designing don't support 800 megahertz, right? Or they don't support 400 megahertz. Not if they're being. Um, it, it depends on the on the level of sophistication of that equipment, but not all equipment will do this. So the customer may be having an expectation for a certain kind of service and what's being actually delivered may be something different. So really important that we understand um, these, these nuances here as we, as we go forward with, with uh, customer solutions. Next slide, please. So um, as this is, this is a challenge. Uh, Again, my my role in this industry over the last several years has been really close to customers. I talk to property managers and building owners and and uh, you know industry companies that are servicing these these um, these needs on the ground, and I, I hear this all the time as we as we as we talk about the solutions available and sort of there becomes a chasm of of what is available now versus what, what is being, they, they think is available. So we have to be just real careful about that. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I like to talk about, um, I, I come from a, from a business angle here uh, in this, in this um, industry. I like to talk about money and cost. Uh, this is, this is, this is sort of where reality uh, meets the, uh, the academic part of these discussions. So just as a level set here, you can see, um, where indoor wireless is today, uh, if just co- as a comparison to Wi-Fi, typically Wi-Fi is about 20 cents per square foot to, to install on your house. If you think you've got a, let's say you've got a 1500 square foot place, you put in a $300 Wi-Fi router or, or you know, mesh network or whatever, that's about 20 cents a square foot. In the enterprise, the expectation today is about 50 cents a square foot. So whether you're getting like a managed Wi-Fi or some other um, sort of Wi-Fi service, it'll, it'll typically come out to be right around 50 cents a square foot installed um, in, in your business. And in the 3G, 4G context, 
it's about a dollar per square foot. Um, it's a, about a dollar per square foot for, for a consumer space. Uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to spend about a thousand dollars for some kind of equipment that's going to bring wireless service into the house. And then in an enterprise, it's about a dollar per square foot as well. And that's, that's kind of an all in number, um, including the installation labor and, and hardware requirements there. And these, this is an interesting number because these, this, this is the number that exists today. If you, if you're wandering around in the marketplace today, selling indoor wireless coverage and, and you're sort of calibrated around these numbers and you'll be, you know, you should be, you know, right in, right in line with, with what the expectations are. So let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, just as a, Oh, it looks like the text got a little bit messed up here, but uh, this is a view from Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Um, this is about a 2 million square foot space and, and the indoor wireless system here was about $20 million. So this was about $10 a square foot. Again, just, just calibrating here on costs. Um, next, next slide, please. So what about 5G? Um, next slide. So we, we, heard, we heard a little bit from Qualcomm. Qualcomm has done an awesome job uh, in the last several years of, of modeling 5G millimeter wave and, and helping the industry understand how to deliver coverage indoors from, you know, starting at the bottom from the chipset and, and looking at things like propagation. And so uh, they've, you know, they've sort of been out in front of this thing along with, with some of the, the network operators. I wanted, to, I wanted to sort of hone in on this specific use case because I think it's, um, I think it's interesting and it's important and it's, it's good, it's, good uh, it's a good metric here. So um, I, think, I think my friend Manish was, was talking about this a little bit earlier, the specific use case. But if you look at this image here, and this is a model that, uh, that Qualcomm put out, uh, you see about, if I count right, there's about 20 uh, APs here, 20 Wi-Fi APs here. And the idea is that you would, um, you would sort of co-site uh, this space with, um, with your 5G millimeter wave antennas uh, or, or you know, your coverage nodes. And so um, you're looking at about, that would be about 20 uh, 5G coverage nodes here. And this particular building is about 30,000 square foot or, or this, this floor is about 30,000 square feet. So next slide, please. So again, some pricing, and I like to do this because this 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 a lot of times will draw uh, draw a conversation or interest or whatever. So let's just let's look at these the, at these numbers for a second. So today, a small cell is if you're looking at a three G four G small cell, they're anywhere around three thousand dollars, five thousand uh, dollars. You can you can choose the number that you want to use depending on um, you know where where you are in the supply chain. Um, I'm using three three thousand dollars a node here. Um, and so looking at this space, um, I'm doing a, like say a three year a TCO analysis for this particular building or this, this, this property owner. Um, don't, don't forget with a small cell, you actually have backhaul requirements. Um, and if you're in a, in a 5G millimeter wave context and your backhaul requirements could be, could be, could be extensive. I mean, it depends on the, on the vendor and, and what kind of service you're looking for. But what I did is I just used a single number here of $1,000 per month for backhaul, which I think is pretty conservative. Uh, but if you take, if you take $1,000 for backhaul and you take $3,000 um, as a, as a cost of your coverage node, and then you have to remember your labor for install, you're at about $132,000 um, to, to bring millimeter wave service inside this building uh, using, you know, using this um, sort of methodology. And that, that works out to be about $4.40 a square foot. Now, if you recall, the, the 3G, 4G space is at about a dollar today. Um, and so actually, I think we, we're, certainly, we're certainly looking at a premium for, for 5G for millimeter wave. I think this is a premium, but I don't think it's crazy. Uh, it's not out of whack. You saw that the, um, for example, Mercedes-Benz Stadium was about, was about $10 a square foot. So if we can get somewhere in this price range, I think for, for millimeter wave, we're sort of in the ballpark. And then obviously it's our, you know, our jobs to, to, to mature this technology and, and make it more affordable to, to drive adoption. Um, next slide, please. So just a final statement. Um, it is early. Um, ED2 Corporation, we're out in front. We, um, we're actually developing products um, in this space, and, and we've actually had to develop components because they were not uh, commercially available to, to put into our products. So it is early. Um, there's lots of room for improvement, and um, we, we, we're, we're helping drive that discussion. And uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space to, to, to connect the, uh, the KPIs that the users are, are looking for. 
And with that, I will hopefully have left a little bit of room for conversation. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to open it up here and um, and you know and ask any of our other panelists if you have any comments on the the TCO uh, calculations. You know, obviously those are ballparks, but compared to ten dollars a square foot, um, you know, quite a bit less than that sounds like millimeter wave could be very competitive indoors. Uh, sorry, Kelly, was that for me? Um, you know, actually, I want to give the other folks a chance oh, to see yeah, if they yeah. want to oh, they, they want to comment on that. Um, anybody? Yeah, yeah, it's Elizabeth. I, I can comment on that. You know, we definitely believe that millimeter wave can be competitive on a cost per square foot uh, perspective indoors. And if we didn't, we wouldn't be doing it. So, um, you know, definitely agree with uh, the other presenters that you know it's got a ways to go, but it definitely can get there. All right, great. Um, so let's see. Uh, wow, you guys have been answering a lot of questions while I've been um, going through slides here. So, you know, I think I want to ask, you know, each of you, um, what you see as the biggest challenge for achieving indoor coverage. You know, each of you have tackled this this in a slightly different way in your presentations. So, you know, let me just just go ahead and ask. You know, what do you see as the biggest barrier at this point in the development of the five G ecosystem? And Elizabeth, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, my answer is probably going to be a little bit biased. I I, I do come from the uh, I started at Verizon in the wireline side of the business, so for me, it all starts with the fiber, right? And so it's, it's getting the, the proper easements, the right of way, the access to, to get fiber to the premise. And then also once you're in the building to get fiber where you need it in the building. So, um, you know, it, again, it all starts with the fiber. And I think that's going to be um, the biggest difference, right, between uh, a, a millimeter wave indoor deployment versus the 4G deployment that we've done in the past where you could use other technologies you know, such as DOCSIS or, you know, public IP over copper, right? Um, you're just not going to get the same performance. Um, and for millimeter wave, you really need fiber if you want that performance. Okay. Roger, your thoughts on the biggest barrier to, uh, or the biggest challenge for achieving indoor 5G coverage? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we are still a little bit limited on the spectrum side uh, here when it comes to the U.S. being more, uh, uh, no local, a local perspective. Uh, so certainly looking forward to the, the C band, the uh, spectrum auction, and opportunities that that will open up in a, a more pervasive uh, uh, 5G uh, uh, deployment beyond what millimeter wave can already do. But, but to me, in a, uh, I think Elizabeth makes a great point. Yeah, we've got to have that sufficient backhaul, but I think uh, uh, opening, opening up of additional TDD bands is uh, also critical for, for a more uh, a broader experience in 5G. Okay. Manish, thoughts on what the biggest challenge for achieving indoor is? I mean, you gave a lot of good examples of places where, you know, it, 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 it was achieved. Um, you know, what, what were the, the challenges of those spaces? Yeah, uh, Kelly, uh, I think uh, it was already answered very well in terms of some of the very uh, big challenges. Another perspective I would add to it is, is maybe just the change in the perception around this, right? Um, because traditionally, whenever we talk of indoor cellular coverage, everybody thinks it is super expensive. Uh, it's going to take too much to design it. You've got to run separate fiber in, inside the building, not just outside, as uh, Elizabeth mentioned. Um, and it's just going to be super, super expensive to do it. Uh, while that is true for 4G, but I think as we were also seeing in the previous um, uh, slide there, uh, I think 5G is, especially millimeter wave, is really going to be a game changer. Um, I think you have products that are coming out which are going to be as easy, easy to deploy as a Wi-Fi AP. They'll use the existing infrastructure like power over Ethernet, and they can just hang off just like a Wi-Fi AP. And that mindset needs to change, and, and I think it'll, that will take some time, but I think as this becomes more widely used, I think, I think it will catch on, but that's certainly a barrier I see right now. Okay. And Joe, your thoughts? On yeah, I think, yeah, I think, um, I think cost, I think cost is, uh, cost is going to be a big challenge for a millimeter wave. Um, 
the propagation obviously is is really difficult, which is going to drive uh, drive the need for more uh, more signal sources, more radiating elements, and and that, and that stuff um, and that stuff is costly. If you if you look at uh, the three G four G context and 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 the penetration of in building systems, it's it's probably five uh, percent or less in the three G four G context, and a lot of that is due to um, just just trying to for building owners trying to deal with costs and so it, it'll be a real challenge for us to 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 try to get the costs down so that they are very palatable for you know for everyone who wants to put them in and they can you know drive an roi with it okay okay great so uh, you know I, I'm, I'm going i'm looking back through the questions some of which have been answered but um Manish, I, I want to go back to one because I think it's important for for in building as we think about planning. And the question was, how do you model in building millimeter wave propagation given how it reflects off of smooth surfaces? Um, so, can you talk a little bit, a little bit? And I'd be interested to hear from Roger and from Elizabeth as well. You know, and how you're approaching uh, getting a good sense of that indoor landscape in order to plan and deploy uh, efficiently. Yep, definitely. So I think uh, there are, I would answer the question in two parts. So what is being done today and where we see things going? So what is being done today? I would say, yes, right now we are being very cautious, right? We have um, only a small number of indoor deployments with millimeter wave. It's a very new uh, wireless technology and there's a lot of uh, questions people always have. Uh, so today the way we do it is that uh, the planning exercise ends up being pretty extensive. If you're planning an indoor venue, you create like a 3D model of that building. Uh, you even look at all the materials that are there, where you have metal, where you have drywall and all that. And then you model that in a planning tool and, and it's a pretty, and these tools use ray tracing and everything. So, so it's a pretty sophisticated process that you go through to do this planning. Uh, so that said, I think that is today, but again, where we see things going, um, is that uh, one as we do this more and more and we are and when we get commercial deployments as we collect more data actual measurements on the ground that is helping us uh, improve our prediction models in these tools uh, which means that we are headed to a future where and very sh very soon uh, where we won't necessarily have to do that extensive level of design like right i was showing you that example of the 10th floor of our building where uh, we are now confident that if we just did a one-to-one -one deployment with a Wi-Fi, we can make millimeter wave work. Um, so, which means that tomorrow, if we had to do something similar, we could take that approach. Probably where it will still continue to be more elaborate, like what it is today, is gonna be in environments where you really have to have a lot of uh, reliability around it in the sense that if you, let's say you're in a manufacturing environment and you can't afford to have a loss of signal in any single corner of the building, uh, depending on the use cases you have there. Uh, but, but otherwise, I think for enterprise environments, for the mass scale deployments, I think we are headed to a simpler future here. Elizabeth? Yeah, no, I mean, I echo everything Manish said. And, and one thing that, that he didn't um, hit on, but I think is super important it, it, is that we're all learning this together, which I think is a really exciting time for the industry as a whole, right? So, you know, because millimeter wave is so different from any prior, you know, air interface technology, you know, it's not just Verizon doing a design or, or, or working in a vacuum, right? We really work with companies like Manish's, Rogers, our partners on these deployments. Um, so we can all learn and build and develop together, which I think, you know, as we said, you know, as we do more of these deployments, everybody in the ecosystem is going to gain that same knowledge and we'll start to see kind of the, the speed and the, the knowledge base just, I think it's going to improve exponentially very quickly. Okay. Roger, any thoughts on what you're seeing on the millimeter wave side in terms of, you know, planning and, uh, and, and how that's happening right now versus what you'd like to see? I, I, I think uh, both Manish and Elizabeth hit the, the, the key highlights. As an industry, we got to simplify uh, and we're learning a lot. And I think we are seeing a lot of simplification compared to where we were maybe a couple of years back. Uh, and I, I am definitely a, a bullish that we will see much more simplification, both c coming from the, the radio side, the planning tool side, intelligence in, in our systems to, to help uh, folks who are designing and modeling. Uh, but ultimately, to, to scale this, right, I, I think uh, uh, simplicity is, is definitely key. Yep. Okay. 
And and Joe, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, on getting a good sense of the, the inside environment, you know, site surveys and uh, and and how you see folks um, approaching things at this point? Well, there's a number of really good uh, tools and companies that that have um, that have really you know, good techniques for for surveying it, and they're and they're bringing their like IBWay, for example, um, they're bringing their their you know their applications up to speed with millimeter wave. Um, it is it's we've we've uh, at ED two we've done a bunch of. Um, we've been doing a bunch of uh, live testing and, and it is really interesting. You find that you, you go into an indoor environment and you do some site survey, site testing or whatever. And then you, and then you, you know, you put in 10 people in the room and everything changes. So even, even individual occupancy can, can change the survey. So there's really a new level of complexity that, um, that, that everyone's going to have to deal with, but uh, I'm, I'm confident that we'll get there. Okay. Well, you know what? I think I'm going to end on that note of optimism um, and, uh, and reiterate, uh, you know, Elizabeth, we're all, again, we're all learning together. And, uh, and so thank you all for providing some insights today and, uh, and giving our audience uh, some of those insights. Uh, thank you again to all of our participants, to all of our presenters. Uh, we really appreciate all the time that you folks have devoted here today and uh, the expertise that you've been able to offer. And this concludes our webinar, so thank you.